Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, so it's difficult for me to speak tonight. There's so many of the people of knowledge that are here uh, listening to me for whatever reason. Uh, but please humor me for a few minutes, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, you know, there's people in this community that actually remind me of Sahaba. You know, uh, when Sidi Feridun, for example, reminds me of Sayyidina Umar. He's actually a descendant of Sayyidina Umar, right? The, the Mujaddidis come from Sayyidina Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I remember uh, when I first met Sidi Feridun, I was 17 or 18 years old. I was actually afraid to speak with him. And it's not like I, I was afraid of, of him because he was going to hurt me or stuff for Allah. I was just awestruck by him. Like Sayyidina Umar, if you saw Sayyidina Umar, you'd be awestruck by him. Right? Shaitan is afraid of, of Sayyidina Umar. Right? Uh, and he was doing khidmah. At the time, he was, he was with Sheikh Hamza. They were teaching classes. And I noticed that there's an intention in his walk. You watch Sidi Feridun walk. Waqsid fi mashik, Luqman al-Hakim says to his son, walk with a maqsad, walk with, a, with an intention, right? So, as Imam Zaid said, some of us walk with an intention, our maqsad is to go home and watch Michael Phelps take the 100 meter fly and celebrate, or watch Usain bolt. We bolt home to watch Usain, right? But we should bolt home and emulate Hussein, alayhi salam. Sorry, that was my joke. <laughs> you know? When I, when I see Brother Mas'ud, who's kind of flying under the radar, I think of Ibn Mas'ud, a multi-talented brother. And brother Mas'ud came to me a few years ago and said, I want to be your Arabic student. So, okay, let's study Arabic. So I was his tutor. A few months later, he was my peer. Not peer in the Desi sense. He wasn't, not peer, not like that. Peer as in, we were at the same level after a few months. All right? So, Yani, Jazakallah khair for humoring me. There's people here that are from Ahl al-Bayt, Sayyid Mubin al-Husayni. Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn. Allahumma ahabba man ahabba Husaynan. Aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. Very blessed individuals are here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. All of you are blessed, inshallah ta'ala, for coming here tonight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless uh, the, the masjid, the people who run the masjid. Uh, Sidi Asif and Sayyid Perwez, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve them and preserve their families, inshallah ta'ala. So kind of to continue what we were talking about uh, last night, I might repeat a few things because I just forget I'm getting a little bit older, so you have to forgive me. But that's okay because the Quran says, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Remind the believers because reminders benefits believers, so you have to excuse me. Um... The ulama say, the Ahlul Ilm, they say that uh, just as the body needs <coughs> ta'am or food for nourishment, the ruh, the spirit needs nourishment as well. And the nourishment of the ruh is dhikrullah. Allah bi dhikrillahi tasmi'inul qulub. Verily, with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our hearts made tranquil. And if you eat too little, then the body becomes sick. Likewise, if you don't make enough dhikr, the ruh becomes sick. If you eat too much, the body becomes sick. But there is no gluttony with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the only difference. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, uthkuru allaha dhikran kathira. Kathira is an adverb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't use this adverb with any other act of ibadah. He didn't say siyam or som kathira, salatan kathira, hajjan kathira. Uthkuru allaha dhikran kathira. And when we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are in actuality following the example of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the goal of our dhikr, the objective of the dhikr, is to emulate him and to align our character with him, as we said in the past, and to taste some of the ahwal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the states of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, Kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yadhkurullaha fi kulli ahyanihi. That the Prophet وسلم, he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of his states. Think about the weightiness of our dhikr. There's three types of dhikr. Dhikr on the tongue, dhikr on the tongue and heart, and then just the heart. Right? The hearts of the sahaba were making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And many of them when they were sleeping, it would come to the tongue. 
You can hear them making dhikr, and this still happens contemporary with awliya. This is something that's documented, something that's seen. They're sleeping, they're making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a holy language. Arabic is a holy language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Arabic. The Quran is in Arabic. The Prophet ﷺ, who's khayr al khalqillah, was an Arab. Right? Uh, Qari Umar, Hafizahullah ta'ala, when he recited a dhikr, Imam Zaid gave the hadith, uh, a tradition, the Prophet ﷺ, describing the power of the dhikr. He didn't translate it. He said, you know how we say, Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah al azim the Prophet ﷺ said about this statement, Kalimatani khafifatani ala lisani. There are two statements that are very light on the tongue. It's very light on the tongue. It's easy to say. Faqilatani fil mizani. But extremely weighty on the mizan. Extremely weighty. On the mizan, on the yawm al qiyamah, there, there are scales. And this supplication or this praising of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very weighty. Habibatani ila rahmani They are beloved to ar-Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah wa bihamdih, subhanallah al-azim. So we have to think about these things. We have to have tadabbur when we make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Engage our hearts in the meanings of these things. Right? The goal again is to tap into the states, the ahwal of the Prophet the, 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 the station of patience, for example. We, 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 we quoted this hadith the other day at the dhikr. What is true dhikr? What is the objective of dhikr? Is to reform the internal character. Because the Prophet said, I was only sent to reform character or to perfect character. Right? So true patience is something that you don't have to think about because you've habituated yourself into emulating the Prophet ﷺ that it becomes second nature, it becomes adat. And this is according to our virtue theory, right? That you fake it till you make it. You have takhalluf, the Prophet ﷺ, takhalluf. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, cry in your prayer. If you can't cry, make yourself cry. If you can't make yourself cry, pretend to cry. Pretend to cry. And then that will eventually become your adat. That's how you acquire a virtue, right? So it's not enough just to come and do dhikr, although there's blessing in that. The malaika descend. Some people are forced into coming here by their parents and whatnot. The malaika still bless them, according to the hadith. But we have to benefit from the dhikr and have this internal transformation of character. The Prophet ﷺ, there's a hadith. He was walking through Baqir, through uh, the graveyard, the cemetery in Medina. And he saw this woman far off sitting uh, by a grave and she was down on the ground and she was weeping and she was being a little excessive with her weeping There's nothing wrong with weeping right what comes from the eye and from the heart is permissible But if you're wailing and things like that, this is not laysa minna man daraba khududa wa shakka al-juyuba wa da'abi da'wa al-jahiliya aw kama qala You know hitting yourself and renting your clothes and things like that So the Prophet sallallahu he approached her and he said and he walked up behind her so she did not turn around and he said, Ya Amat Allah, O maid servant of Allah, Ittaqullah, uh, Ittaqillah, Wasbiri. Have a uh, taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be patient. And then she immediately snapped at him and said, You've never been afflicted like I've been afflicted. You've never been afflicted like this. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is no refutation of this statement. Now we know, Ashadda Bala'an, the, the, the most extreme type of Severe type of uh, tribulation comes to the prophets and then those closest to the prophet. The prophet ﷺ was orphaned at six years old. His grandfather died when he was eight years old. His beloved wife Khadija al Kubra, she died after over 25 years of marriage. He had seven children, he buried six of them. Imagine, seven children, you bury one child. People go into depression, they can't function. He buried six of his children and he knew that his seventh child, Fatima Zahra, Qurra to Aini, the delight of his eye, the apple of his eye. He knew that she was going to pass six years after. And he knew about Imam Hussein, what would happen to Hussein alayhi salam. In Sunni traditions, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, Hadith of Al Hakim in his Mustadrak, Hadith Sahih, Umm Salama says, The Prophet وسلم, he was sleeping, he suddenly istayqadha, faj'atan. He woke up suddenly and he was agitated, agitated. And then he tried to go back to sleep, and it was difficult for him. 
And then, istayqadha, again. He eventually slept and then he woke up again. This happened three times. Thumma istayqadha. Wa fi yadihi sharifa turbatun hamra. And in his hand was red soil. This is a hadith in Al-Hakim. In his mustadrak. Sound hadith. Rigorously authenticated hadith. From Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And he was yuqabbiluha. And he's kissing it. This red soil in his hand. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, what is this? He said, this is the... Uh, the Turab of Karbala. This is uh, Jibril alayhi salam came to me and said that my grandson Imam Hussein, the beloved Habibur Rasulillah, the beloved of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hussein alayhi salam, who came into the masjid, who heard the voice of his grandfather on the minbar, and he comes into the masjid, following the voice of his grandfather. The Prophet, he descends the minbar, picks him up, hugs him, kisses him. And then reascends the minbar and finishes the khutbah. This is Hussein alayhi salam. When uh, the army of Yazid brought the heads into Damascus, they paraded them around. This is part of our history. It's painful to talk about, but we have to mention it. We love Ahl al-Bayt. We love them with all of our heart. And this is fard from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They brought the heads, they're parading them around. They're sahaba in Damascus who had no idea what had happened. Sa'd ibn Sa'd, a Sahabi, old man at the time, he sees this, this Eid happening in Damascus. Right? So he goes to Zain al-Abideen, who's tied to a camel. And he says, what can I do for you? Zain al-Abideen. Who is Zain al-Abideen? Ali ibn Hussein. This is the son of Imam Hussein. Right? The great, great grandson of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He said, what can I do for you? He said, do you have any money? He said, yes. He said, pay these soldiers to, uh, to allow the women of Ahl al-Bayt to cover their faces. They had torn off the hijabs to, 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 to insult them. And then they brought the head of Imam Hussein in front of Yazid, and he took a stick, and he was hitting the, the, the blessed lips of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. And he said, uh, al-harbu sijal hadha yom li badrin. Like Abu Sufyan ibn Harb said before he became Muslim. Abu Sufyan ibn Harb radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a Sahabi and we respect him. He became Muslim, he proved good his Islam, he died in a ghazwa, he lost his eyesight. But this is what Yazid did. He hit the mouth of Imam Hussein. He said, war is attrition, this day for Badr. Right? Sa'd ibn Sa'd said, wallahi, he said, way haka, woe to you, wallahi, wallahi, I saw the lips of the messenger touch those lips. I saw the lips of the Prophet ﷺ touch those lips. The Prophet ﷺ, he knew, he knew about this. So anyway, back to the hadith. He didn't argue with her. You've never been, uh, you've never had a musibah like I've had a musibah. The Prophet ﷺ, he goes home. The Sahaba, they approach this woman and they say, do you know who that was? He said, and she said, ahadum minkum. She's, he was one of you, right? And they say, no. Huwa Rasulullah. This was the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she makes haste. She runs and stands behind his door. Standing behind his door, waiting for him to come out. Eventually he comes out and she says, I want to be patient. I want to be patient. The Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, does not scold her. What does he say? He gives her a gem of guidance. He said, إِنَّمَا الصَّبْرُ عِنْدَ صَدْمَةِ الْأُولَى أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ It's a true patience is when the affliction first hits you. That's true patience. That's prophetic patience. When the affliction first hits you and you have patience. Imam Ali said, giving a tafsir of this hadith, that if you hear something, if you hear about a musibah, and you just slap your thigh like this, you say, ah, like that, he said, you haven't been patient. What do we do when we hear about a musibah? This is our reputation now, that Muslims have short fuses, that Muslims are very reactionary. They don't think, they just react. They don't know how to think. This is a stereotype about us amongst non-Muslims. Muslims don't know how to think. They just react. Al-ajalatu, al-anatu min Allah, wal-ajalatu min shaitan That uh, precaution and thinking things through is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But haste, being hasty, being reactionary, this is from the shaitan. The Prophet sallallahu he never acted in anger. The Sahaba couldn't even tell he was angry. Except that his face, his blessed face, countenance, would have a little bit of a tinge of red. And there would be a vein in his forehead. Like Sayyidina Umar one time is reading the Torah scroll. He's reading the Torah. And that's not for Sayyidina Umar. That doesn't mean that you're not allowed to read the Torah. right? Zayd ibn Thabit, he mastered Hebrew, learned the Torah to make da'wah. That's his 
job. That's his occupation, his wadifa. But Sayyidina Omar is not supposed to read the Torah. So Sayyidina Omar, so I'm reading the Torah. I look up. The Prophet is looking at me, and he's angry. He said, describe his anger. He was smiling. <laughs> he was looking at me angry. So he was smiling. He said, yes, but I saw a little vein in his forehead. His face was slightly red, tinged red. He, he said, I dropped the scroll and said, I seek refuge, a'udhu billah, I seek refuge from the ghadab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the ghadab of his messenger, from the anger of Allah and his messenger. There's another sahabi, Abdullah ibn Mughafal al-Muzani, who was on an expedition, he found a piece of food on the floor, he hid it like this, and he said, Wallahi, I'm, never, I'm not going to share this with anyone. He just said it to himself under his breath, I'm not going to share this with anyone. And then he said he looked at a distance away, a distance away, I don't know, 30 yards, 50 yards, Right? Men understand yards more than feet probably because of football. Many, many yards away, he sees in the distance somebody is smiling at him. A disapproving smile. Right? So he called five other men and they shared this little piece of food that he had found. This is the concern of the Prophet So this is true patience. Patience isn't, you know, I'm going to be patient uh, after I've punch someone in the face, or after I've abused my wife, or after I've, you know, made a fool out of myself and I'm all embarrassed and I'm going to have patience. No, true patience is that when that sadmatul ula hits, when that first musibah hits, that you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the Prophet sallallahu remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you remember Allah, who do you remember next? Rasulullah. This is bil idafa. This is uh, according to annexation. Rasulullah, the messenger of God. And when you remember the messenger of God, you remember his dhikr. You remember to be patient. You remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, you control your actions. Right? So this is one of the benefits of dhikr, is that it aligns our character with the character of the Prophet wasallam. Last night, we were talking about love of Ahlul Bayt and the special position that they have, love of the Prophet wasallam. We discussed the, uh, the shahada of Imam Ali, karamallahu wajha, and its significance and the lessons that we learned from it. So we'll continue with that, inshallah ta'ala, for a few minutes, and then we'll end the talk, inshallah ta'ala, so we can hear from my teacher, Sidi Faridun, inshallah ta'ala. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to hadith of Ammar bin Yasir, radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, he said that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, and you can read this in Tariq al-Khulafa, of Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti rahimahullah ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu said to Ali, he said that two men are going to have the most grievous type of punishment in al-Akhirah. Two men are going to have the most grievous type of punishment, the most painful, tormenting type of uh, adab in the, in the afterlife. He said the fair-complexioned man of Bani Thamud who hamstrung the Naqatullah, the she camel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one. And then he said, and the man who is going to strike you here, and this will be saturated with red. The man is going to strike you here, and this is going to be saturated with red. The Prophet wasallam is a prophet. What does a prophet mean? A prophet means someone who prophesizes, someone who gives information. We have this whole corpus of eschatological literature, hadith fi akhir zaman, really interesting stuff, amazing, ajib. We don't read our, we don't read these things anymore. Muslims go into the newspaper and I'm a Sagittarius and oh, I'm going to meet someone nice, you know. Read this hadith, really, really unbelievable from the Prophet wasallam. sound hadith. Give you an example. During the Meccan period, there was a, there was a lot of persecution of Muslims, very, very, uh, Heavy persecution of the Muslims. The Prophet وسلم, he approaches the, uh, the person who carries the miftah of the Kaaba. His name was Uthman ibn Talha. He said, I want to enter the Kaaba. Right? And uh, he said, no, I'm not going to allow you. You're a Muslim, you can't come into the Kaaba. The Prophet وسلم, says, لَعَلَّكَ تَرَى يَا Uthman, لَعَلَّكَ تَرَى هَذَا الْمِفْتَاح يَوْمًا بِيَدِي Perhaps he will see that key one day in my hand. Perhaps you're going to see this key one day in my hand. He said, Laqad halakat Quraysh. He said, Quraysh must be, must be uh, destroyed on that day. Quraysh must be destroyed on that day. He said, no, Quraysh is honored on that day. 
Right? This was during the Meccan period, during a time of massive persecution of Muslims. Many years later, during the Fath Mecca in 8th Hijri, the Prophet ﷺ, he's coming into the city. There's a long procession coming into the city. And in the front is Sa'd ibn Ubadah. He's carrying the standard of the Muslims. And he's shouting, and he passes by Abu Sufyan ibn Harb. He had just become Muslim. And Abu Sufyan is standing next to Al Abbas. Anhu. And as Sa'ad passes Abu Sufyan, he says, Al Yawma Yawmul Malhama. Adallallahu Quraysh. Today is a day of slaughter, the debasement of the Quraysh. Today is a day of slaughter, the debasement of the Quraysh. And Abu Sufyan hears this. And word reaches the Prophet. And he doesn't like it. He didn't like that. So he sent a rider up to Sa'd ibn Ubadah and he says, take the standard from him and let them see that the standard is being, because he's scaring the people. People are being frightened. Take the standard. So the rider comes to Sa'd ibn Ubadah and he says, the messenger of Allah says, give me the standard. He says, no, I'm not going to give it to you. I don't believe you. I'm not going to give you no standard. Right? So he comes back, the rider comes back to the Prophet Sallallahu and he says, he's not giving up the standard. The Prophet Sallallahu he unwinds his red turban. Is Imam Sharifa. And he says, Give this to Sa'ad and say, Give up the standard. But give it to Qais ibn Sa'ad. Who's Qais ibn Sa'ad? The son of Sa'ad. This is the wisdom of the Prophet. Because when you honor the son, you honor the father. If I shake your son's hand, in reality, I'm shaking your hand. I'm honoring you. Right? Because he knew this would bother Sa'ad. It's going to bother him and it's going to be in public. So let them see that you're giving it to his son. Right? This is how he deals with people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he went up back to, to Sa'ad and he immediately gives it up. And the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he passes by Abu Sufyan into the gate and he says, Al Yawma Yawmul Marhama. Yu'izzullahu Quraysh. Today is a day of mercy, the exaltation of the Quraysh. Today is a day of mercy, the exaltation of the Quraysh. The Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he do then? He climbed Abu Qubais and people were saying, you know, he said, what should I do with you? And according to the Jahali custom, what, what, is, what is he to do? He would cut their forelocks and sell them into slavery. And they knew that was going to happen. And that's if he's being merciful. You know, the Torah says, wipe everyone out, Deuteronomy chapter 22. If the city is of these cities that the Lord thy God gives you as an inheritance, save nothing alive that breathes. This is the hukum in the Torah. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu what does he do? He climbs Abu Qubais and he says, I'm going to say to you what Yusuf Alayhi Salam said. And many of them don't know what Yusuf Alayhi Salam said. So, he, and what did he say? La tathriba alaykum ulyum. There is no blemish on you today. Allah has forgiven you. Go and you're free. Go and you're free. Many men had fled Mecca during this time. Like Ikrama ibn Abi Jahal. Ikrama is the son of who? Abu Jahal, who was worse than Fir'aun. The Prophet ﷺ said Abu Jahal was worse than Fir'aun. Because when the, when the waves crashed, what did he say? Fir'aun. Amantu, I believe in the God of Bani Israel. Wa ana min al-Muslimin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we're going to save you in your badan, in your body. Right? But when Abu Jahal was slain by Ibn Mas'ud at Badr, he said, I want you to remove my head from the base because I wanted to be big and I wanted to scare Muhammad. This is what he said. Obstinate. Ainad till the very end. So Ikrama, he fled. He tried to cross the Red Sea. And there's a couple of traditions as, as to what happened at this point. But one of the traditions say that, uh, that the boatman was a muwahid. He was a uh, monotheist and he wasn't allowing any mushrikeen onto the boat. So somehow Ikrama got on the boat. Maybe he just said, okay, la ilaha illallah. And he got on the boat. Somehow, now, he ends up in the water. <laughs> He's splashing around in the water. And he says, Ya Hubal. Ya Hubal. Oh, the, you know, this God. This God that the, uh, the pagan Arabs used to worship. And the people on the boat start laughing at him. You're calling on a God, Hubal, who is Hubal? Right? Call on Allah. He said, then I knew. He said, faith entered into my heart. So he goes back to the Prophet Sallam. But he sends a messenger before him. He's, I'm getting the time out here. I'm getting the acts, inshallah. Finish the story, then we're done, inshallah. He sends a messenger before him to come into the city. And the Prophet, he tells the Sahaba, 
that have been wronged by Abu Jahl. He was the most wronged by Abu Jahl. He says, I forbid you from abusing Abu Jahl. His son Ikrama is coming. Look at, look at the magnanimous nature of the Prophet His son Ikrama is coming to me now as a Muslim. He's going to make bay'ah to me. So he comes, the Prophet he takes bay'ah with the Prophet and he says, let, let me do something for you. The Prophet says to him, let me do something for you. And he says, just ask Allah to forgive me. And he says, I always knew there was some good in your father. I always knew there was something good about your father. And it was you. You are his son. This is how the Prophet ﷺ, he dealt with people. This is just one example of a prophecy. One example of a prophecy. So finishing the story now, Imam Ali, when, because there was a pact, right? We don't have time to go through the story, but there was a pact by Khawarij. Khawarij are interesting lot of people. These people are fire and brimstone theology. If you commit a minor sin, your blood is licit, they'll kill you. Right? They declared Imam Ali a kafir because of the tahkim, the arbitration that happened. So they met in, in Mecca, at the Kaaba, in Ramadan. Three of them. And one of them said, I'm going to go to Damascus and kill Amr ibn al-As. The other said, I'm going to kill Muawiyah, I'm going to kill Ali. Those two failed, but this man, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam al-Murari, and the Prophet ﷺ, he described the killer of Ali to Ali. And Ali used to point him out to his companions. He says, this man right here, he's going to kill me. This is according to our sources. This man over here is going to kill me. He says, why don't you kill him? He says, oh, who's going to kill me then? He wants to become shaheed. And he also said, well, how is that going to look? I, it's going to look like I'm killing an innocent man. And these people are going to say, oh, he's, just, he's killing his companions. This poor man didn't do anything. So Sayyidina Ali, he's leaving the masjid, and he gets hit here. It splits the cranium, and his beard is immediately filled with red. And his last words were what? Fuztu wa rabb al Kaaba. Fuztu wa rabb al Kaaba. I have triumphed by the Lord of the Kaaba. This is an Arif Billah. This is a Gnostic. This is someone who knows Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. This is someone who's in a state of of istighraq, who's annihilated to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. His only his only object of contemplation and love is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm out of time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us like Imam Ali and Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Uthman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to, to, to know the reality of things, to see the world as it really is, to make us people that are people of knowledge, to make us people that are uh, people of patience, people of mercy like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.